So our topic is practice of devotion. Devotion is designated as bhakti, the word bhakti or bhajanam in Sanskrit language, which is related to a Sanskrit root, bhaj, that's bhajasevayam. It stands for puja, service, worship, adoration, extreme, transcendental, love for an almighty reality. All these are the meanings implied by this particular dhatu. <coughs> now, um, you know, there is a special reason why uh, this topic is very dear and very popular among the spiritual aspirants. One very important reason is this path is very simple and very natural and very easy. See, in bhakti, or at least in one of its most popular forms of uh, devotional practice, uh, we don't give up anything. What we do, we divert, we channelize our natural human impulses and emotions towards a higher reality, a kind of sublimation. In fact, that is the very unique feature of this path of spiritual practice. Three norm human beings are normally devoted to their relations. Mother is devoted to her child. Father may be devoted to his son. And children may be devoted to their parents. So, these human relations are built upon certain human emotions and impulses. Now, these human emo emotions and impulses can be given a spiritual dimension by diverting them towards God. Then it becomes bhakti. In other paths of spiritual practice, we have to gain certain new characteristics. We have to give up certain characteristics. For example, in, in the path of knowledge, we have to use our power of uh, intelligence, our ability to discriminate the real from the unreal. Normally human beings consider this world, all ordinary human beings consider this world as the only reality and God as something unreal. Now, a, a spiritual aspirant who follows the path of Jnana, I mean, Jnana Marga has to reach the conclusion at the intellectual level and then experience at the emotional level that God is the only reality, everything else is unreal. So from the normal conviction that world is real and God is unreal, which is very common to ordinary human beings, he has to reach the level where, where he is convinced that God is only reality and everything else is unreal. So it is naturally, it is a long, difficult road. Not very easy. Again in Karma Yoga, to be always active physically and mentally and intellectually without being attached to the result of our actions. It is certainly a very difficult task. And that is true of Raja Yoga also, the path of psychic control. Slowly we have to reduce our impressions and ultimately we have to reach the stage when our mind becomes completely free from all impressions. Yoga ka chitta vritti nirodha. So all the mental impressions will have to be neutralized. So all these parts are somewhat difficult. You have to you have to give up certain things which you have normally practiced and you have to acquire certain things. But in bhakti, you whatever love and affections, emotions and impulses that you have got towards worldly things, divert them towards God. 
That's all. That's why the great, one of the earlier uh, exponents of bhakti ideal, the, devo, the path of devotion, his name is Shandilya. He uh, defines bhakti as para anurakti, supreme love. Sa para anurakti ishwari. The love and emotions and attachment that normally we have got towards worldly things should be diverted to God, Ishara. Then that is Bhakti. Another great exponent of Bhakti philosophy is he was Narada. He classifies Bhakti into two levels. The Para Bhakti and the Apara Bhakti. <coughs> Parabhakti is the supreme. I mean, the I mean the de- devotional practice when it, when it, when it has reached the highest level of perfection. It is called parabhakti. <coughs> now, Satu Asmin Parama Prema Rupa. He defines bhakti as Parama Prema Rupa. It is in the form of Supreme devotional love towards the ultimate reality, towards God. <coughs> but this is the highest type. There is another kind of bhakti which is called apara, means vaidhi bhakti or normal practice. See, we get up in the morning, we do a certain number of japa or prayer, maybe confession, worship, devotional reading reading sacred scriptures with great devotion. That we normally do. So, meditation for one hour, sacred reading, scriptural reading for one hour, and then this we may repeat twice, a day in the morning and evening. Now, this is the beginning of devotion. It, there is an element of formalism and there is something mechanical about it. But you know, you had to be formal at the very beginning. This is called the formalist bhakti. Bhakti or devotional exercise, which consists of certain uh, practices, certain beliefs, which we follow regularly without failure. <coughs> and Narada says, this is necessary, but this is only beginning. There is one great danger and also there is one great advantage about it. If you develop this bhakti, which is called secondary bhakti or apara bhakti or mechanical, mechanical may not be a proper translation, secondary may be a better translation, kind of devotional practice. This helps you to have a good beginning. It helps you to start your spiritual journey. And it gives you a well-defined uh, path which you can follow with great concentration and devotion. Difficulty is sometimes it becomes an end in itself. So you will find, for example, those who follow, well, now I have to do meditation, I have to do japa, half an hour, under or two hours, or I have to go to temple or a church or whatever, maybe. I have to read for some time. Now I have to fast. Well, uh, and he's very particular about it. But the problem is, it becomes mechanical because you l- draw a line of demarcation between your spiritual life and the rest of your life. So you will have spiritual life for four hours of the day. Two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. The rest of the time, you don't bother. So, but this kind of discipline, this kind of formal practice of devotion is the only way to begin. But it should not be an end in itself. <coughs> As it is Suranandaji says when we were reading this morning. It is necessary, but we must somehow establish a link between our daily devotional practice and the rest of our life. I mean, whole life should be spiritualized. Then this 
सेकेंडरी भक्ति और वट इज कोल्ड मैकेनिकल भक्ति बिकम्स सुप्रीम भक्ति सुप्रीम डिवोशन सो पराभक्ति सुप्रीम डिवोशन अपराभक्ति इज सेकेंडरी डिवोशन और गोल इज टू रीच द लेवल ऑफ सुप्रीम डिवोशन वेन the the line of demarcation between devotional life and the rest of the life vanishes whole life gets spiritualized so narada defines satu asmin parama prema rupa the here he refers to the bhakti of the highest type <coughs> but at the beginning we have to start the journey she where child has to start his education at the kindergarten level so sometimes he has to he has to be told every day you must practice so you must read or you have to do this you should avoid wasting time and so on but a scholar need not be told he knows where he has to go and he doesn't need any external supervision that is para bhakti so when we think of secondary devotion what we do the normal human relationships uh, are given a spiritual orientation our uh, but then we have to remember human relationships are not neglected in fact a great devotee will be an ideal father an ideal husband an ideal wife an ideal brother and he will be an ideal citizen also so when we uh, spiritualize our life when we give a sp- spiritual or devotional orientation to human relations relationships we are giving them a higher dimension <coughs> so according to traditional philosophers of bhakti school it is easy and it is open to all because in other spiritual practices certain important qualifications are uh, stressed for a beginner for example those who take to the path of knowledge must have a strong sense of discrimination discernment between the real and unreal and who should be an aspirant for liberation so nityanit vastu vekha mumukshutvam samadhi sarka sambhati and you know he should uh, have perfect control internal and external control he should the senses should be under his perfect control and again uh, he should not have any desire either for worldly comforts in this life or heaven in after life so not a very easy thing for an ordinary spiritual aspirant to acquire so also for other parts but this is open to all anyone can start his devotion like any moment but he should be pure and he should be sincere sri ramakrishna puts his idea you know vyakulata he uses the word which is really sanskrit origin which implies <coughs> sincerity integrity concentration uh, and a great earnestness and uh, a sen- serious sense of purpose all these are implied by this term <coughs> vyakulata so anyone who has got this vyakulata can take to devotional life that's the unique feature of bhakti <coughs> well i can give some examples based on certain stories taken from puranic textbooks one for devotion of the lower i won't say lower secondary type and for the another example for devotion of the supreme higher type those of you are familiar with the famous classic devotion classic it is a purana bhagavata purana and those who are not of course may not be many of you may not be able to read the original text you can read this story in the well known book of sister nivedita the cradle tales of hinduism sister nivedita tells you the story of dhruva Dhruva was a small boy son of a prince of a king a king's name you find uttanapada 
This king had two wives. <coughs> Story which comes in the Bhagavata Purana, which tells you how even a small boy who felt, well, my mother is, my father is not caring for me, my father doesn't treat me well. And he felt, and a small boy gets, you know, if he denied his chocolates or toys, he felt. That discontent takes him to the highest level of spirituality, devotion. Of course, he is not an example for Param Bhakti, but he is a supreme example of secondary devotion of the highest type. <coughs> As I said, you know, this king had two wives, Suruji and Suniti, you find in that book. Suriji was the younger one and Sunidhi was the older one. So this king, though he was otherwise a very noble, uh, ideal father and all that, but he was more attached to the junior wife. And slowly he started neglecting the senior wife and her child. He, the senior wife, he, her name was Sunidhi and her son was Dhruva. Dhruva story, as I said, you know, is narrated by uh, Sister Nivedita in the Cradle Tales of Hinduism, a famous book. This boy one day tried to climb the lap of his father. At that time, the stepmother was somewhere watching. She didn't like it. Sometimes these sort of things happen in families, in ancient times, you know. So, and Dhruva felt somewhat hurt. And a small boy of five years, he comes to his mother, mother, and weeping and crying. Mother said, in a casual way, she didn't mean anything, but you pray to God, all your problems will be solved. A casual, she was a very noble woman, so she didn't complain. She didn't criticize his mother, sorry, his father or step. Of his, uh, I mean, the other wife, the wife, I mean, Suriji, who prevented uh, Dhruva from climbing the lap of his father. Sunidhi was a noble woman, her name itself, you know. Sunidhi. So she said, Well, don't worry, these things are common. You pray to God. And you pray to God, you realize God. In that story, God's name is given as Vishnu, means God, that's what. And Dhruva took it, took it very seriously. And he goes to the forest. Those of you who want to read the original text, you find this in the Bhagavata Purana, in the fourth skandha, means fourth book, between eighth and twelfth chapters. In five chapters, it's called Dhru, Dhruvobakhyanam, the story of Dhruva, is narrated. 8th, 9, 10, 11 and 12 chapters, 5 chapters. So Dhruva goes to the forest. And on the way, he, our old friend Narada comes. The same Narada who uh, defines Bhakti as Satu Asmin Parama Prema Rupa. Now Narada's main self-appointed duty was to go everywhere and search out, if, is there anybody struggling to realize God? to practice spirituality. And if he finds somebody, he will go and help him. Give him a helping hand. That was his self-appointed duty. So Narada appeared before Dhruva as the boy was slowly going to do penance and he was walking through the forest. So Narada saw this boy from a distance. And he felt surprised. A small boy of five years and he wants to realize God. He wants to practice devotion, bhakti. And then, Aho Kshatriyanam Tejaha. Narada exclaims to himself, Oh, what is the power of determination? That, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that glory of the Kshatriyas. Uh, this boy, was such a small child, he feels hurt when he was... Uh, be, I mean, uh, slighted by, uh, belittled, insulted by his stepmother. And he goes to forest to do tabasya, to do penance, to realize God. But Narada exclaiming this, he comes to Dhruva. But then he changes his tone. Because Narada wants to test whether Dhruva had the necessary 
mental equipment to reach his goal. Those of you who have attended uh, Lake Tahoe retreat will remember, you know, Sandushta Satatam Yogi Yatatma Dridhanishcheha. In the 12th chapter, Bhakti Yoga, in the Gita, Lord Krishna says, a strong will, a strong determination is one of the most essential requisites for a devotee. Not only in material life, a strong will, a strong determination, an adventurous spirit, put in other way, a love to live dangerously, as they put it in modern language. This is necessary not only to succeed in material life, but also in spiritual life. So Narada wants to test this boy to make sure that he is fit for receiving his instruction. Then he comes to the boy. And Dhruva tells his story. Then Narada says, you are a small child. What about God realization and all this? See, many of I have, they say sometimes parents won't like their children going to asamas or temples or church because this spiritual practice will come later. Now you be busy with the worldly life. So sometimes it happens, you know. So parents won't like their children to be too spiritual, to be too meditative, to be too introspective. That may block his material progress. So Narada wants to test, you are a small child, it is not for you to go to forest and meditate on God and all that. These things are very common in family life. You go back to your palace and play with your uh, cousin. Cousin is the Uttama was the name of the prince, the son of Suriji, the other wife. And your father is very much worried about, about you. He's wondering where my child has gone. But now, Dhruva says, no, no, no. Uh, Dhruva says, well, my mind is determined. I am fully determined to reach my goal, no matter what the obstacles might be. So Dhruva proves himself to be a boy of strong determination. So this is a test of a real devotee. In devotional life, in spiritual life, you will have to face a number of obstacles. And a strong determination and a strong faith are essential for one to succeed in spiritual life. Maybe much more so in spiritual life than in material life. So, Narada is very pleased. Then he uh, instructs Dhruva to, I mean, how to practice meditation, how to meditate on Lord Vishnu, God, and he goes and he go to the river bank of Kalindi, a river, and practice spiritual meditative life. And within six months, Lord Vishnu appears before him. It is said that for six months, I don't, I won't want to go details. Stage by stage, Dhruva intensified his spiritual practice, and when he when he reached the sixth month the final stages of spiritual meditative life, he completely absorbed Lord, the object of his meditation in his heart. Means he, he meditated on Lord Vishnu as the supreme reality seated on his heart. And then the whole world became astonished and Vishnu appeared before him and gave him devotion. Then Dhruva, there is a long prayer, with Dhruva starts, Dhruva Studi, famous one. And then uh, Vishnu uh, tells him, well, I am pleased, I know what you are looking for, I know what you are desiring, and what, is, what, you, are, what you want from me, you will become the next King, you will be, become the heir apparent of the kingdom. After your father's passing away, you will be the next king and you will be, you lead a happy life. And at the end of your life, you will become uh, uh, an eternal reality. It's called Dhruva Nakshatra. means mean you become Dhruva star. You know. Dhruva. This is a mythological story, I have to remember. You will, remember, you will become eternal and you will become a mighty star. 
This is the no. Remember, this is a story. The point is, Dhruva wanted something not necessarily very spiritual. He was hurt emotionally, and he wanted to remedy his result. So here an ex- is an example of a devotee uh, asking God to be, I mean, to be kind enough to uh, grace him, to bless him with his material needs. And it is said in Ramanuja's commentary on the Gita Bhashya that those who pray to God with some desire for some material purpose will get his purpose fulfilled and out of a sense of gratitude to God he will start praying to God without any motive or without any desire and slowly he will graduate, he will evolve from devotion with a purpose, with a motive, to devotion without any motive, from Abharabhakti, secondary devotion, to supreme devotion, Parabhakti. In the same spiritual classic, devotional classic, there is another story, the, the story of Prahlada. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa refers to Prahlada and uh, classifies him as the greatest of all devotees because he didn't want anything. Prahlada was the son of a demon. You can say an evil man. Very powerful, very learned and very wicked. His name was Hiranyakashipu. And his, worst, his greatest enemy was Vishnu. And Prahlada's greatest object of adoration was the same Vishnu. So his father was the greatest enemy of God. And God was Prahlada's greatest friend. So naturally the father got angry. Prakhlada was all the time uh, chanting the name of God. Not only that, his father arranged some, t- some type of teachers to teach him uh, that God is unreal, world alone is real. Uh, all such negative education, let us say. But that didn't have any effect on Prakhlada. The more they tried to educate Prahlada on along negative lines, the more devoted Prahlada became. So, in fact, one of the uh, most uh, important uh, uh, description of the philosophy of bhakti in Hindu tradition is attributed to Prahlada. One day, the Hiranyakashipu asked him, Prahlada, please come, let me hear what your teachers have taught you. The father thought, well, this my boy must have been well educated, which means he should have been educated that God is unreal, world alone is real. This kind of you know hedonistic or epicureanistic, this kind of <laughs> this kind of negative education. But but when Prahlada started telling him what he had had learned from his teachers, his father became very angry. And he says, Saravanam Girtanam Vishnu, Smaranam Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakhim, Atmanivedanam. Idipumsa, Thida, Vishnu, Bhaktische, Navalekshana. Kriyade, Hi Bhagavat Yadhva, Tan Manne Adhida Muttamam. Prahlada's definition of the practice of devotion is given here. Prahlada is a supreme example of bhakti of the highest type. Parabhakti. Prahlada didn't want anything. Prahlada always wanted to be psychologically and emotionally near to God. Nothing more. He didn't ask for anything. So when his father asked him what you have learned, Prahlada tells him what he himself was teaching his classmates. Prahlada used to catch hold of his friends and teach them the ideal of supreme devotion. And his father wanted him to learn the, the, just the opposite of it. So when the father asked him what you have learned, he said, you should always hear about God and his glories. You should always sing hymns in, in praise of the Lord. And then you should always remember God. And you should consider every act of yours as a worship of God. So, Sravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnuho, Smaranam, Padasevanam. Archanam, Vandanam, Dasim. You should always mentally 
pray to God, worship God, and you bow down before God, and you should consider yourself as the servant of God. These are the instructions coming from the son of a demon. Because the Hiranyakasipu was a very clever, shrewd man. He was going in search of this Vishnu, who is a mischief maker, who is the object of worship of his son. So with a huge mace, fully armed to the teeth, he was going around all over the world in search of the object of worship of his son, who was his enemy. And Vishnu hid himself in Prahlada's heart. And he, that was a place where Hiranyakasipu could not uh, search him. So here it is said, the author of the, the devotion classic says, Vishnu took a permanent residence in the heart of Prakhlada. So, and then one day it seems that this, of course he, the, the child was tortured by the demons, including his, his father also, but still he did not give up his devotion. And ultimately, when the torture became unbearable, it is said that the Lord himself descended and killed the demon father and Prahlada was saved. This is the story. But you know, the, in, in the Gospel of Siddhamakshana, he gives Prahlada's name as a classic example of devotion of the highest type. These are the two classic examples. One example for for as an example for secondary devotion, that is Dhruva, another example for devotion, the highest type, supreme devotion, Parabhakti, that is Prakrata. Now, uh, you may sometimes wonder, what, uh, what, what, what is the process of developing devotion? There are two types of uh, processes normally uh, explained in devotion classics. One you find in Bhagavad Gita, 12th chapter, from 8th to 11th verse. In four verses, Lord Krishna gives four types of devotion, devotional practices, four stages of the evolution of devotional practice in a descending order. And uh, the great uh, philosopher, Sri Vaishnava, Vaishnavite philosophers, Visita Dvita philosopher, Dhammanija, uh, gives uh, a, clear, a graphic description of the ideal of self surrender in his book. So, Dhammanija says the best way for one to practice devotion is to surrender oneself. To God's grace, which he called Saranagati, is Sanskrit is called O Prapatti, means complete surrender. You will remember in the Gita, in the second chapter, Arjuna says, Eva Muktua Rishi Kesam Guda Kesha Parandava, Na Yotse Idigovindam Uktua Tushni Babhuva. See, Arjuna says, Well, I won't work. I won't do my duty, etc. Then, after that, Arjuna says, Well, I surrender myself to you. So, Maam Prapannam, teach me who has surrendered himself to you, the supreme path of devotion. That's Arjuna's request. When this request directly came from Arjuna, Sri Krishna opens his dialogue, his conversation with Gita. Similarly, when a man opens his heart, when he surrenders instead of God, he becomes an instrument in the hands of God. So long as he thinks that he himself is the, is the doer, the actor and also enjoyment of the result of the enjoyer of the results of his action, God keeps in the background. The moment a devotee really feels himself that he has surrendered himself to God, that moment 
he becomes an instrument in the hands of God. Then God himself starts functioning through him. Sarvadharman parityajya mamekam saranam vrcha. Aham tua sarvapapi bhyo moksha shyami ma suja. In the 18th chapter, Lord Krishna says, You surrender yourself completely to me. That's the, that is the that's supposed to be the charama sloga, the most important, the last important words of the Gita according to devotional school of philosophy. Now, when a ma- when a person, when a devotee surrender himself or herself completely to God, then God Himself starts functioning through him, and we call it the grace of God. Now, Ramanuja says there are six important characteristics necessary for an ideal devotee to reach this level of spiritual self-surrender. The long list is, first, he must keep his mind filled with uh, positive thoughts, thoughts, thought currents which are helpful in spiritual life, in devotional life. Because if you, uh, if negative thought currents enter the mind of a devotee, what happens? There will be a lot of conflicts. Conflicts in spiritual life are mostly due to conflicts between positive thought currents and negative thought currents. If a devotee spends some time for spiritual practices, meditation, and again, Rest of his lifetime, if we, if if the devotee spends in uh, in doing things which may not be helpful in spiritual life, negative thought currents also enter his life. So there will be conflict. That's why while meditating, those who try to meditate without uh, getting fully settled in spiritual life, uh, all types of uh, shocking, troubling thought currents come to the surface. Because mind is not fully established in positive thought currents. So Ramanuja says the first step in devotion life is that you must try to fill your mind with positive thought currents, positive impressions, positive ideas. And along with that you must also avoid the entry of negative thought currents negative ideas, ideas which cause conflict in our mind and confusion in our mind, which take away, which take us away from the devotional path. So, anagulyasya sankalpaha, which means filling the mind with positive thought currents always time. Pratikulyasya varjana means completely avoiding negative thought currents. We cannot deliberately avoid negative thought currents. Suppose you decide, well, I will not allow this this particular thought to enter my mind. Then you will be always thinking of how to avoid those thought currents from entering you, which means you will be always dwelling on those negative thought currents. So that's why Ramanuja says, the best way to avoid negative thought currents from entering your mind is to try to fill your mind with thought, positive thought currents. If you move towards the east, naturally you'll be moving away from the west. You need not deliberately make an effort to move away from the west if you are moving towards the east. The more, the closer you, the farther you go towards the east, the farther you'll be moving away from the west. The third characteristic which Ramananda gives is this. Rakshisidhidi Vishwasaka means a strong conviction that God is the sole protector and God will protect me. That God will protect me. Rakshisidhi means, means He will protect me. It is a future sense, future tense. So, Ramanuja says, God, one, a devotee should always feel that God will protect me all the time. God's willingness, readiness, to bestow his grace on the devotee is emphasized here. And the devotee should also feel 
should have a strong conviction that God is the sole protector. Then only God will protect you. So, Goptruta Varanam Tatha. Gopta means protector. The one who controls you, regulates your life, protects you. So, first we must try to fill our mind with positive thoughts. Thoughts which are helpful in spiritual life, in devotional life. And then, of course, casually it is mentioned, we must avoid. Whenever negative thought currents try to enter, you must avoid. How? Deliberately, you must try to avoid physically engage, physically engaging yourself in negative ideas, negative thoughts. I mean, you cannot physically prevent thoughts from entering your mind. But you can certainly prevent yourself from doing wrong things at a physical level. That's what Ramanujan means. So when you see a wrong, when you see a wrong picture, when you think a wrong thought, when you hear a undesirable sound, all this can enter, all this can bring negative thought currents to your mind. As I said, you know, in the Vegat Sudamani, the great Shankaracharya describes how all the five senses uh, drag mind to the external objects and these five senses uh, bring negative thought currents, destructive thought currents to our mind and mind gets completely lost and that leads to destruction. Shabda divi panja bhireva panja panja tumapusa gunena badhaka kuranga madanga padanga meenaha brunka nara panja biranchida kim. It's a famous verse in the Vivega Chudamani. Shankara says, see, all the time, all the five senses, means sense of perception, senses of perception, vision, hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting, all these five senses of perception are dragging your mind simultaneously at one time towards external objects. So when you see a, an undesirable object, your mind and your eyes cooperate and you see the object. When you hear an undesirable sound, your ears and mind cooperate. And that process, that, that process uh, drag your mind towards external things and this again leave their impressions in your mind. So also, all other three senses, all the five senses generally drag human mind towards external objects. Shankara says, in the case of deer, ears become the uh, cause of uh, mind being dragged towards external objects. Because it is said in the ancient times, hunters used to uh, uh, sing on some kind of musical instrument and hearing this sound, deer will come out of his hiding place, bush or cave, and then the hunter will shoot him shoot the deer and shoot the deer will be killed. So, uh, the sense of hearing becomes the cause of his death in the case of a deer. And in the case of elephants, the sense of touch. Elephants move about touching each other and they fall in a pit and they are enslaved or may be killed. And then what about moths? When there is a blazing fire, these moths are dragged, attracted towards that. And they fall in the fire and they are killed. And what about fish? The fish is draw, attracted by the bite, bait I may call it, and then it is killed. So, and then uh, also there are this, some kind of insects, creatures, which go about collecting honey from different flowers. They are attracted by the, the smell of flowers and then they are being killed. Now, Shankara says, when it comes to man, all the five senses are active simultaneously. They bring all sorts of thought currents and impressions to the mind. And therefore, Ramanuja says, we must be very careful 
about negative thought currents entering the mind because it becomes it it works like a poison to human mind and then one should have a strong conviction that god will always protect you and god is only protect then atma nikshepa karpanne shadvidha sharanagati the fourth the fifth and sixth atma nikshepa means one should have a sense of self surrender to god and then one should have a sense of aversion towards uh, anything which stands in the way of spiritual life there is a, there is a, the story of a great evangelist who lived in india he was a christian evangelist maybe stanley jones perhaps he lived in the central provinces in 20th century maybe before independence now <clears throat> you know he he was a great uh, uh, evangelist who took pity on gandhi because gandhi being not a, a non christian such a good man will go to hell that was a great lamentation he is very f- famous for making that statement gandhi what a good man but poor man will go to hell because he is not a christian now they, but this he was a great devotee of god Stanley Jones he was very sincere in his own chosen profession mind you he was a great devotee it is said that once he fell sick and uh, he was on, almost on the verge of death and he kept praying for weeks but uh, there was no improvement in his health condition and ultimately uh, it was almost decided that he would go back to europe Uh, for recouping his health he will have to terminate his evangelical activities in india and one night it seemed that he prayed for such a long time and almost by the uh, almost at dawn when it was, it was almost daybreak he said no i shall not pray to you anymore there is no use i leave the whole i close the bargain i leave it to you it is said and from that day onwards he started recovering that is to, that's how the story goes and he started he com- he continued his evangelical work in india for the next 20 25 years that's how the story goes so when you stop praying for anything that is the beginning of spiritual life but that doesn't mean that you should not pray because through prayer only you can reach you can go beyond the level of prayer prayer is necessary if a child says well i am not going to do kindergarten because the teacher will force me to study all the alphabet everything so i would rather go to phd class the university because there you don't have to study the alphabet the child will never have any kind of education so prayer is the beginning of spiritual life but when the prayer reaches the highest level of perfection you will realize that even praying for something tangible like physical health or material life is a kind of secondary type of devotion and when you go even beyond that you reach what ramana is called prapatti or sharanagati and that is the beginning and also end of spiritual life because the great uh philosopher his name is you know uh, shandilya says bhakti is not only the goal but it's an end in itself as a path it's a means but when it reaches its highest supreme transcendental level it is the goal in itself so she says ata eva phala anantyam therefore bhakti is its own goal bhakti is the means at a second as a secondary level when we, because you have to start your journey by filling your mind with thoughts related to devotional life related to god by making by diverting all the five senses and mind intellect everything towards god then bhakti becomes a means an effective tool in spiritual life but at the highest level you will not be able to think of anything other than god 
you will not be able to dwell on any idea other than God. That is the God itself. So bhakti or devotion is the means at the secondary level and the end and the goal at the supreme level. That's who Ramananda says. Now in the Bhagavad Gita you find, as I mentioned earlier, Lord Krishna gives a graphic picture of the evolution of a devotee. From 8th verse to 11th verse of the 12th chapter, that is Bhakti Yoga, Lord Krishna gives uh, a graphic presentation of four levels of human evolution in devotional life. The 8th verse is Mayeva Mana Adatswa Mai Buddhi Nivesaya Nivasi Shesi Mayeva Ata Urdhamna Samsaya. This is the 8th verse. But Lord Krishna says, the highest devotee, he surrenders his mind, intellect, everything, his memory, everything to, to me. To me means, means God himself. And then the devotee will live in me and I will live in devotee. That is the highest type of devotion. That's why when you feel that you you, you you are living always in God and God is always living in you and when that spiritual practice reaches the highest level of perfection it is not different from Advaita it is not different from the uh, realization of the identity of individual soul and Supreme Soul. It is called Jiva Brahma Ikyam itself. That is the uniqueness of this kind of bhakti. You feel that God as a supreme reality is living in you. And also you are living in God. This is a kind of subjective experience from a mystical point of view. From an objective point of view, you also feel that the entire creation is an expression of that supreme reality, God Himself. And you feel that you are, you, you are one with the entire creation. A kind of feeling, a kind, a kind of experience that the entire creation is one spiritual reality. And this, this, such devotees are sometimes called in the bhakti tradition, they are called Bhagavadottama, means Uttama Bhakta, devotee of the highest type. In the same Bhagavata Purana, there is a well known description of a devotee of the highest type. In that Bhagavata Purana, the author says, the one who experiences the presence of God in all beings and the one who realizes that all beings are an expression of God. He is my dearest devotee and is the greatest devotee. Sarva Bhudeshuya Pasyet Bhagavad Bhava Matmanaha Bhudani Bhagavadi Atmani Esha Bhagavadottamaha. It comes in the form of a dialogue. These dialogues are very interesting. In the Bhagavata Purana, you know, there is a there are many dialogues. Here is a dialogue between nine great sages who visit a famous king of those days. The name of the king or emperor, his name is Nimi. And the nine sages you may or may not remember, but since you can make it sufficient. Kabir Hari Randareksha Prabuddha Pippalayanah Avir Khotrodha Chamasa Kairabhajanah This means Now, this, uh, I have just, I have just recited that verse, that's all. I shall give the names of these nine great sages. Kavihi Hari Andariksha Prabuddha, Pippalayana, Avirhotra, Chamasa, 
Karabhajana. Now, these nine sages come to this king and they ask certain questions. And one question they ask, how to worship God, how to practice devotion and what are the characteristics of an ideal devotee. Then, Antariksha, one great sage, he defines who is the highest devotee. High, the highest devotee is in fact the same man whom we call the highest jnani. Sri Ramakrishna is in the gospel. The path of devotion and the path of knowledge, they are the same at the highest level. When you reach the highest transcendental mystical experience, then the devotee and the man of wisdom, the follower of Jnana Marga and Bhakti Marga are the same. So, sub at the subjective level, he feels that God is, the, what you call, Andarya, I mean the indweller residing within him. And he also feels that he is residing in God. At the objective level, he feels that entire creation is nothing but an expression of God. So you cannot love your God and hate his other children. In fact, that is the basis of the universalism, universalism of uh, Vedantic devotion, Vedantic philosophy and also devotion philosophy. At the experience level, you feel God is one and is residing in all living beings. And the entire creation is not different from Him. So God is not an extraterrestrial God who creates this world and stands apart from His creation. Rather, the Creator and creation are the same. In fact, the greatest of Advaitic teachers, Shankaracharya himself, says in the Gita Bhashya, he says that the highest devotion and the highest bhakti at the experience level are the same. Those of you who want to refer, if you take the 13th chapter, 10th verse, the verse begins like this. He says, the, uh, you can read that verse, 11th, 13th chapter, 10th verse. There, Shankaracharya says, he, um, uh, he defines the purest devotion. Uh, and then he says, this pure devotion, it is achala, avibhijarini, bhakti, bhajanam bhakti. Then he says, this devotion, which is, which has, which is free from any wavering, any kind of inner conflicts, and then he says, Sa Chaknyanam, that highest devotion is Jnanam itself. That says, that is the that is that is the, the these are the words of Shankara. Sa Chaknyanam, that highest devotion is Jnanam itself. Now <clears throat> the question may arise how to develop this kind of devotion? In fact, here as I said earlier, one should first of all uh, try to give a spiritual orientation to all our thoughts and deeds. See, ordinary uh, people, you, they cannot uh, begin with devotion of the highest type. Those who are involved in different activities of secular life, householder's life, they cannot neglect their duties, they cannot start uh, 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 with the highest devotion. But so Sri Ramakrishna says, live in this world, do all your duties, perform all your responsibilities, but somewhere in the corner of your mind, remember that God is the only supreme reality. This should not make you negligent in your duties and responsibilities, should not make you indifferent towards your duties and responsibilities. 
But when a conflict comes, when a disappointment comes, we sometimes may be forced to turn to God. But before that disappointment comes, better the beginning itself think that God is a supreme reality. Then you can avoid disappointment. Even if you don't accept God, God exists. Sri Ramana says, not a blade of grass moves without His will, God's will. So even if you don't accept that is, that is God's will, that is the only power behind all your actions, still it is God's will only. The difference is, if you do not accept, you will have to face a lot of anxieties, trust, trust and tension. If you accept it, you can avoid it, that's all. You are not, you are not uh, discovering a new truth. Even if you don't accept the fact that God's will alone is behind everything, it is God's will only. If you accept it and live in this world, we can avoid anxieties, problems, psych conflicts and all that. If you do not accept it, you have to face all this. If you accept it, then you can say everything is a play of God. So whenever there is a conflict or problem or tension, then you can remember everything is God's will. So that can work as a cushion, as a saving factor in times of crisis, tension and all that. But that's one, that's one way to practice devotion. It's better not to wait for a crisis to come in your life and force you to turn to God. If you can accept the truth at the beginning itself, and not wait for a crisis, that's easier. Generally, if we read the lives of many great saints, many Saint Francis of Assisi, or in the also so many you find, Tulsi Dans, Narayana Bhatta, many, they have to face a lot of crisis. Sometimes disappointments, sometimes shocking experiences. It happens. So, Lord, the Lord Krishna says in the Gita that even people who turn to God compelled by circumstances, they are certainly far better than those who never turn to, turn to God even when they have to confront terrible disappointments and disillusions. Now, a number of examples you can find in, in, in the history of devotional philosophy. For those uh, great saints who... Uh, be, who completely transformed their life when they uh, turned their emotional crisis and disappointments towards God. Instead of being shocked and swept off their feet by their shocking experiences, they just turned all this towards God. I can give one supreme example that is uh, you, those of you who have who may have seen a book called Narayaniyam. You may have seen perhaps this. Narayaniyam is a famous, it is supposed to be the greatest uh, Sanskrit hymn. In Sanskrit hymnology, it is supposed to be the greatest and most beautiful, and most profound Sanskrit devotional work belonging to the branch of hymns. Its author was Narayana Bhatta. He was not just an ordinary devotee. He, he was supposed to be one of the greatest scholars in Vyagarana and Mimamsa, means either in Sanskrit grammar and also in Sanskrit uh, ritualistic philosophy. In fact, he was such an outstanding scholar in all the known branches of learning of his time. He lived, he lived in about in the later part of 16th century and the beginning of 17th century. And this well-known books on grammar and Mimamsa philosophy and many other branches of learning are so well-known and they are, they, are, they are studied by research scholars. But his greatest book is, most well-known book is a small book, as I said, you know, Narayaniya. It was translated into English by Swami Tabasyananda, who was the vice president of Ramakrishna Mission. Now, his life is one of the supreme examples. He was very proud of his learning 
and he who was following a path of secondary devotion very strict in his devotional practices getting up morning dot but then for him devotion was just part of his life it had reached it has become a kind of mechanical devotion regimented devotion as i said earlier uh, devotion at the secondary level has got one disadvantage sometimes it degenerates into some kind of mechanical devotion like an army surgeon army commander say very with they be very very strict and very punctual but that won't take you one inch towards supreme devotion so this man was an outstanding scholar some is supposed to be a genius and remember his name is famous not only as a philosopher who has written original books in sanskrit mimamsa and and, and literature sahitya and also vyakarana this man was very proud of his learning and one day he was spending his time in studies and studies only intellectual pursuit without in without spending much time in devotional practices so one day his guru made a remark oh, what a pity such an outstanding scholar his teacher the one who taught him vyakarana means sanskrit grammar what a pity this man if he takes to spiritual devotional life it will be wonderful somehow he happened to overhear this this suddenly he realized he was an outstanding scholar but he has spent all his lifetime in acquiring knowledge and writing profound philosophical works on grammar and philosophy but it didn't work he overheard this and from that day onwards he became so shocked of these words which were uttered in uttered by his teacher who did not know that his disciple was overhearing this that made a complete transformation in his life and the rest of his lifetime he spent in a temple immersed in spiritual practices and every day he will sit in front of the deity before lord narayana vishnu and he will meditate and write 10 verses and in uh, and in 100 days he completed 1000 verses and that book is supposed to be the greatest one of the greatest books on sanskrit hymnology it is a condensation of the story of lord krishna as expounded in the larger book bhagavata purana so such examples you can find in 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 many places like that so it is called a kind of you know no, what we normally call a difficult crisis critical crisis or dilemma in our life is suddenly changed into an instrument for higher evolution in devotional life we have already taken about 45 minutes but no one and a half, one hour 15 minutes for the next 15 minutes if you have got any doubts or clarifications we can have some kind of interaction up to 11:30 <coughs> if you want to if you want me to explain if you, if you De- greater detail what i have already explained or any new ideas if you want you can raise and i shall try to explain maharaj you gave two great examples guru and pakla especially druva his father was a rakshasa druva's father was pakla das yes pakla das yes also there are tendencies each one of us and you know according to our uh, philosophy and our uh, hindu dharma there are past tendencies when we were discussing how to meditate all these negative thoughts all these things they enter these are because we believe of past tendencies they are still there in these two examples prahlad rakshasa and of course guru the father did not understand the simple thing he is also myself mm. so how did these people get to that level nothing is known about their past 
But the past of Hirinikar, uh, Hirinikar Shibu, is Prahlada's father. I mean Prahlada and Dhruva. So they should have been the greatest devotees to death, into that level, mm. to fight these, uh, fight the consequences like father being Rakshasa. In our own th- meditation, when we enter little conflicts, little uh, thoughts, all these things enter and then destroy the concentration. Now the question is, how do you get to that pure uh, point of devotion when you are meditating. Yes. And of course, I should uh, say things a few, say, try a few things. Prahlada, when even when uh, uh, when his mother was bearing the child, Narada instructed her. And he said, a child who was not yet born, listened to all this and he became a great devotee. This is how the story goes. And in the case of Dhruva, uh, Dhruva must have practiced devotion in his previous life. Otherwise, uh, he would not have been born to such a noble mother who gave a direction to her own child to turn to God to solve what may be, kind, what may be called a family crisis. Now, if for an ordinary, for, for, for a spiritual aspirant these days, when he has to face conflicts and problems in meditative life, he should try to um, spend more and more time in devotional reading, in devotional discussions, when he is not already engaged in in uh, spiritual practices. So, uh, uh, he should try to establish a link between his life and his the tot- I mean, all his activities with his devotional idea. If you are spending only two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening for spiritual practices, and the rest of the time if you are engaged in other activities without any spiritual thought, then what happens? During this time, you may acquire many negative thoughts which will remain in your mind and they will come in the form of conflicting thought currents when you try to meditate. So how to reduce it? Meditate, uh, the meditative mood should be uh, practiced even when you are engaged in other activities. Medita- kind of meditative mood should be practiced internally even when you are engaged in activities which are not directly associated with devotional life. Mentally we can do. That's what Yadisirandhi writes in Meditation Spiritual Practice. A link should be established between our normal routine, normal activities, norm, when, when we are engaged in normal responsibilities, and meditative life. Otherwise, there will be an artificial barrier between your meditative life and other life. And that can create conflicts. Because if you don't think about the spiritual ideal when you are engaged in other activities there is a great danger suddenly negative thought currents may enter your mind and they will remain in the chittam they will come to the surface when you try to meditate so all our activities should be given a kind of spiritual orientation the line of demarcation between the spiritual and secular should slowly vanish then only meditation becomes natural. That is the one way. So what? You can read good books. Through good books, good thoughts will enter the mind. That may help you in meditative life. Suppose you have read the life of Siddha Mangshuna, or Shankaracharya, or Swamiji, or Holy Mother, or St. Francis of Assisi, or Buddha, anybody for the matter. Then try to meditate. Suddenly your mind may dwell on ideas we acquired from there, these great lives. That will not create conflict. But if you have read something else, a thriller for example, or Terminator, and then you start meditating, what happens, you know? You, your mind will be engaged in those thought currents. You want to meditate on God, suddenly Terminator will be, will be coming to your mental surface. So, so all at other times also, you must try to engage your mind in acquiring ideas, accumulating ideas, which will not create conflicts in the mind. 
Even when, when a farmer, when he is involved in farming activities, he can think of God, this is my duty, God has given me this duty. There have been great men. You find in Mahabharata, there was a great devotee. He was a great jnani, Vyatha. He was, his job was selling meat, cutting animals and selling meat. Particularly in a very violent activity. But he was a great jnani. He thought, this is the work which God has given me in this life. So, even while cutting meat, it was God he was thinking about. Not the meat which he was cutting with a knife. That never occurred in his mental horizon. God came to his mental horizon. So, see how he establishes a link. Vyadha Gita is a So, you can find. This is something which every spiritual aspirant should practice at the beginning. And becomes natural for for a an advanced soul. That's what this book says. <coughs> a true devotee with full faith in, in God. Uh, maybe he's not uh, Bhakti Yogi is not practicing spiritual things all the time, but he is doing only good things that he believes to be good things and trying to offer to God. <clears throat> and uh, from the external world, from this society, he gets a very cruel treatment for doing a good job from his conscience and actually accepted universally as a good job. He's trying to do a lot, but if he uh, in this crooked world, you know, this, uh, he gets some punishment, undue punishment. Instead of, instead of getting reward from it, he gets punishment. So, how should he, you know, how can he maintain his belief in God, faith in God, when he knows that I have been this torture me for a good thing when I instead of getting the reward. And I am I am giving I'm doing good job offering it to God. And yet, you know, external world of society is torturing me like that. So uh, two two questions. How best he can keep his faith alive, you know, that God is Mungal Mungal Mai, you know, God is for good only. He, he, uh, uh, in sort of a reward, God is giving me this punishment. You know, whoever does in the society, no, I say it is from God. How will he maintain that, his belief? What is the best way that he will not waver away from his path of devotion? Mm. And the other is, uh, if he is a true devotee, true believer, not, and best to his knowledge, he is not doing any bad thing. No department. Is there in real life, is there really any chance that this is only game? Ultimately, God, you know, like Prahlad faced so many tortures, and ultimately God uh, rescues him. So, uh, can he believe with in mind that I stick to my faith, and I, I, I stick to my good work, I stick to my bhakti, and God is going to take care of it. This is temporary testing of my faith or something, but God will surely take care of it. He will remove, somehow, remove the uh, torture problem. This, uh, the, these two things. What is your answer? Yes. And in fact, um, I would have dealt with this subject uh, if I had gone through the rest of the verses. I referred to the 12th chapter. I referred only to the 8th verse, Mayeva Manathutsa, etc. 9th, 10th and 11th verses uh, actually deal with this problem. But anyhow, I shall come to this briefly at this time. In the next class, I shall deal with the other 3 verses. You know. In descending order, Lord Krishna gives a description of 4 types of devotees, 4, I mean, four, level, 4 stages of evolution in the 12th verse. Now, in the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna gives an answer in the form of a story. Of course, this is a very high order of devotee. A great ascetic, a monk, uh, 
and the devotee was uh, tortured by robbers and then you know you story and then uh, and then some who he was rescued by some good people and he was fed and he was treated then who who tortured you somebody asked him they said and who is feeding milk to you who is saved your life then the devotee said Uh, the one who tortured me is now protecting me and feeding me wow. of course that is the highest uh, i siddha level means highest level of perfection but at the lower level if one uh, keeps himself busy i mean engaged in reading such stories such devotional classics the lives and teachings of great spiritual personalities slowly you will uh, develop and in the strength to confront your problems problems will not be solved but when you become stronger the problems appear to be less intense that's what happens you increase in strength you your your strength to confront the problems increases and in proportion to that you feel the problem as less and less intense that's what happens so these spiritual ideas uh, equip my equip our mind uh, and make uh, make, uh, make us fit and capable of confronting our problems uh, they make us more capable of confronting and facing the problems and to that extent these problems appear to be less and less intense less and less threatening that's what really happens. so as an effect of reincarnation no that way of course okay. that's true no re, no that that is another way of analyzing things you know that is true but if you analyze everything in terms of karma theory and law of in reincarnation uh, it may sometimes make you a fatalist and that's a serious problem in spiritual life you see if ever if you are just a tool in the hands of uh, your actions the results of your actions of previous life then there is no scope for you to improve your lot then god has also no role here so this kind of logic is sometimes uh, negative it can have a detrimental effect in devotional life so for a devotee he should have a strong feeling god can look after me by his grace i can improve my lot he should forget about uh, he should not think uh, takes very seriously reincarnation or the karma theory and all that because he can that's a, the astrologers have got a serious problem you know they are what you call destinians or fatalists uh, they believe in a kind of everything is predetermined that that kills your initiative spiritual initiative that should be avoided maharaj swami pavitananda maharaj you know this question came up so one day he angrily said he does not kind of believe in reincarnation or he never talks about mm. it but then somebody asked him then he said you know the lord and deity whoever made the law of reincarnation mm. can also overrule it anytime yes <laughs> yes i tell you i should not name anybody but one one a very outstanding monk in ramakrishna mission uh once had a problem uh, one uh, astrologer had predicted that uh, he will have to face a serious crisis in spiritual life so he was very much worried and uh, began the astrologer was an outstanding man but all great astrologers will tell you astrology is a science but god is greater than astrology because astrology is a form of calculation based on the position of stars and constellation of stars and milky ways everything but all this were created by god so if you believe in astrology and fate and then you are you, you think you are helpless you are actually denying the existence of god so if, so if god has written this line on your palm he can erase that line he can delete also so that is the argument so from a devotional point of view uh, fatalism or law of karma or these things do not have much value they they are, they are they are true i mean 
according to the system of Vedanta philosophy. But uh, the argument is, if God has destined it this way, then he can rectify it, he can modify it. That's the idea. If you say the God himself is a victim of his own fate, you know, then you are, you can't say God is uh, all merciful, omniscient, omnip- omnipotent, all that. Swami, can you say what happened with that Swami who had been, it had been predicted, what happened? He is a great monk now. <laughs> he is a great monk. It's a, a proof of the grace of God. And the same logic can be, I mean, extended to, you know, I mean, you earlier mentioned a lot of imperfections in the surrounding nature or in the society, but again, it's a manifestation of God. So still, there is scope for improvement and uh, advancement, either in a, in, a, in a karmic level or in a spiritual plane. Is that, is that best way to explain, Raj? Yes. Uh, though the world is a creation of God and everything has been ordained by God, Still, man can improve his lot by doing good for good work for others. That's what Swamiji meant when he said, the world is a gymnasium for us to work out our karmas. I, either you may say world is, uh, is under the grace of God or is a is myth. I mean, is, sorry, it's a mithya according to Vedanta. Both are right. Right. Two ways of putting the same truth. But then, uh, we need not run away from the world. The world is a gymnasium. No, you don't go and stay in a gymnasium. You go there, you work out, you do something which may be... Uh, you, you engage yourself in some activities which uh, help you to become stronger and healthier. That's all. Like that, this world is a place where we can do good work for others and thereby we can spiritually evolve to a higher level. That's the way. That's what Swamiji means by that. I think we have already... Would you... You will be present this evening? Uh, yes. Then uh, shall we terminate because already we are two, three minutes late. I have just one question. Ah, please, please, please. I'm sorry, sir, sorry, ah, please, but, please. Uh, uh, my question will really be because I am not really very strong spiritual person. Okay. I have a lot of books. But I have traveled a lot of places ah. and Last 20 years, I've been asking moms and sadhus this question often. Again. Yes, yes. And the, my question is again, just like uh, to give you an example. When I was coming across this year one, I had lost my job because the GPS went down. And uh, then I suddenly saw that we done the retreat, uh, uh, small little place there. And that uh, gave me a realization that, okay, the retreat center is here. So this is my question. For the last 20 years, I've been asking this question. What are the signs that there is a God? What are the signs? Just like we had that small little retreat center written that convinces me that at least I can search for something. Mm-hmm. What are the signs? Because I have been asking this question so many times. Mm-hmm. One monk in uh, rather very renowned saint in the Himalayas, he told me that God is within, within you. Some said you will get your signs when you feel passionate about it, you feel emotional about it. But the question is, what are the significant things, maybe material, maybe unmaterial, but how, because we talk of so many things like yes. abstract. Yes. So what is the concrete proof or concrete uh, kind of set signs, some mm-hmm. kind of symbols that say that this is what are the symbols of God. Yes. And therefore you can go towards it. Yes. Now, one way is, if you look at the world, um, from one angle, you can see there is a perfect harmony and rhythm and orderliness. See, look at the, think of the law of gravitation and all this. You can find there is a there is an inherent symmetry, harmony, a rhythm. From another angle, is perfect chaos. Is it not so? You can find. Well, but. Uh, the same chaotic condition appears to be perfectly orderly and uh, in perfect harmony from another angle. Now, if this world is the creation, if the world has got a harmony, then there should be uh, one supreme intelligence behind it. Uh, if you think that human, God is, the, uh, is an invention of human intelligence, 
or human speculation, then uh, you have to admit that uh, a machine could produce men like Shankara, Buddha, Sri Ramakrishna or Jesus Christ. Cannot. So, how do you explain this unique spiritual personalities who have been exerting their spiritual influence on succeeding generations for millennia, for centuries and centuries? How do you explain all this? How do you explain the perfect serenity and equanimity and tranquility associated with great men who could face all this? Think of a man like Gandhi, for example. Gandhiji was, he was not a founder of a religion, but, you know, he could confront the crisis of physical extinction, death with chanting the name of God. Here I am not talking about Jesus Christ being crucified or Shankara vanishing or Siddha Maksha. They are all, well, we all consider them to be incarnations. Let us say, Buddha and so on, Jesus and so on. But what about these great personalities who lived in this world and who were in the midst of what we normally call secular activities, mundane activities? See, organizing a whole nation, leading them against British Empire is not a very spiritual, Not there is nothing... Spirituality involved in apparently. How could he do, how could he chant the name of God while passing away? You may not agree with all, with all that is said and taught. So, so how do you explain this? Uh, ji was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. Many great people. There have been many such great men. We know. People, you may not agree with their views. But you, you can't deny that there was something about them which made them so tranquil and peaceful and serene in, in the, in the, in the, while facing critical situations in life. It's not co- common people be frightened by that. So, and they were practicing certain things. Call it, believe in God or whatever it is. How do you explain all this? So, f- or if, you, if there is an effect, there should be a cause behind it. So, if you trace the effect to its cause, this world cannot be without a cause behind it. But these are different arguments. You know. So ultimately, we, there are many things which we cannot prove in the laboratory of science, but they are intensely felt and experienced truths of life. Love karma is an example. You can never prove it in the laboratory of science. But you ask people privately, Many people believe in it. Apparently, they will, you can't present a paper on the Congress of Scientists and Law of Karma. They will law, they drive you out of that conference. They will uh, remove your name from the list of scientists. But go to them and ask them privately. Many of them believe in it. So there are many things that we cannot prove in the laboratory of science, but they are much more closely and intensely felt. This is one proof. Of course, we have uh, exceeded our time. Thank you for asking the question. You can continue your question in the next session. Thank you, Namaskar. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Dasa Sri Ramasnar Pramastu.